Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Crumash. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a very special presentation. Deb Wolf is going to be talking about um, SURF. It's an underground laboratory um, that deals with scientific things. I'm not even going to try and make up what, <laughs> what it is. She's going to explain it all. Um, I want to thank in advance uh, the Levy Senior Center Foundation for sponsoring these lectures. Without their organizational support, we would not be able to do so. Uh, we would not be able to host them. And thank you um, for your generous support of us um, because it all flows together. I also want to give a special shout out to one of my fellow board members, uh, Jordan Halverson, who um, actually is the one who suggested Deb uh, as a presenter, and I'm thrilled that he did so. Um, so thank you, Dorrance. Um, I think that's it. Deb, please take it away. All right, I, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is share my screen for a moment, just a moment. Let me get that going. And all right, so I am, uh, I'm super happy to have been invited. Uh, I also want to thank my uncle Dorrance Halverson for making the connection that brings me uh, to you today. It's just crazy sometimes how the winds of fortune uh, end up connecting people together. And so Uncle Dorns, thank you, thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm hoping my mom's also online, hi mom. All right, uh, so what I'm here to talk with you about today is the place that I work, the, this amazing, unique, one of a kind place, the Sanford Underground Research Facility and I've titled this talk, Exploring the Unseen. Uh, I think what I'll do is just, just give you a short bio, a little background about, about myself. So my background is in K-12 education. For more than 20 years, I was a high school science teacher. Uh, I worked in California and Las Vegas and then came back to South Dakota and I taught most of my career in South Dakota, high school science primarily. Uh, after I left the classroom, uh, I worked as what's called an instructional coach, which was the, the joy of my life, working with uh, early career teachers, supporting them, working with them, um, providing feedback, coaching them up. Uh, all of those good things. And I did that, did that uh, job for about seven years. Uh, I was briefly a building administrator. It wasn't my jam, not my favorite thing. Uh, and then I transitioned to working at the state level in education. Uh, I was the South Dakota um, Department of Education's education innovationist. And the role of the innovationist was to work with school administrators to tackle some of those system level problems, things like uh, workforce development, opportunity gaps in education, uh, attendance issues, um, uh, effects of poverty on education, those kinds of things. And then about two and a half years ago, I got the opportunity of a lifetime to direct the education and outreach program at SURF, at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. It's a mouthful, so I'm gonna say SURF most all of the time. Very recently, as in in the last couple of months, I've added two more hats uh, to, uh, to my work. And I now also currently oversee our public outreach, so our adult, um, adult outreach, and then also our work in diversity. We call it IDEA. So inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. And I've been at that for all the two months. So I got it all figured out, right? Oh my goodness. Um, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be working at the premier underground science laboratory in the country. Um, frankly, one of a very few in the world. I'm gonna add one disclaimer. 
to my presentation. And that is, I am not a scientist. I am e an educator. Um, I do not presume to fully understand the intricacies uh, of the research that's happening at SURF, but I am excited and inspired by it. Um, and I'm absolutely an ambassador and an advocate for the research that's happening here and also the outreach that is happening here. Um, and my background in education, I feel really allows me to help students and teachers connect the science that's happening in their classroom that they need to learn to the unsettled science, those questions that we haven't yet answered um, that's being researched here at SURF. So a quick geography lesson. So here is the state of South Dakota. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar, familiar with Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore is in the Black Hills on the western side of the state. Uh, and where I work, where SURF is located, is in the small town of Lead. Uh, Lead is in the northern Black Hills, about an hour north of Mount Rushmore. So just for a little bit of perspective, where we're located in South Dakota. One of the things that you're gonna find here in a little bit is that there's a very intimate and important connection between surf and where y'all live. Uh, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. So what is surf? So the Sanford Underground Research Facility was created by the state of South Dakota on the site of a former gold mine. So where I am standing right now for 125 years was an operating and very prolific gold mine, probably the most prolific in the United States. Uh, that gold mine operated for the 125 years until the year 2000. At that time, the price of gold had gone down. Um, we were mining at very deep um, uh, levels. Uh, and so it became not particularly profitable. And so the state of South Dakota um, provided a, a huge chunk of money, $50,000 or $50,000, $50 million. Barrick Corporation, which owned the property, donated the property to the state. And then there was a philanthropic gift of $70 million uh, that allowed this place to be converted from a gold mine, an operating gold mine, to a world-class research facility. SURF um, occupies a oh, little over 200 uh, acres on the surface. About 7,700 acres underground. And get this, 370 miles worth of tunnels and shafts in that underground space that were all created in pursuit of gold. Our current operation uh, is funded uh, through the Department of Energy uh, with a cooperative agreement. We are what's called a user facility, which means that researchers come here and use our facility because of what it has available that is not available in other places. So I go out and do presentations to students all the way from grades kindergarten through high school and on to college, et cetera. And I ask them this question, why? when Barrick shut down the home state gold mine in the year 2000, why were there people, why was this group of researchers super interested in creating laboratory space nearly one mile underground? 
So here's what I want you to do. You might be sitting by yourself. I want you just to think. You might be sitting watching this with someone. If you're sitting watching with someone, have a conversation. Why might scientists want to do science nearly a mile underground? Because I promise you, it's not easy. The logistics of doing science nearly a mile underground is particularly challenging. So take a moment, think about it. Maybe you even throw some of your ideas into the Q&A. Not sure. I'm just going to give you a moment. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to pause and let you think. So here's what students say. Probably the most common thing. You're doing something super secret over there. Nope. In fact, when we take people underground, we encourage them to bring their cameras and take photos. Uh, we have an outreach program. We're telling the world about what's happening at Sanford Lab. Uh, second most common, you're doing dangerous stuff. And so you're going a mile underground to protect us all from the dangerous stuff. Nope, not dangerous stuff. And probably the third most common is you're looking for, I don't know, crazy critters that live underground. Well, there's a little bit of truth in that actually. Uh, we do have a, a, a research group that are searching for and trying to understand what are called extremophiles, which are little organisms that are able to sort of live at the edge of what's possible for living things. So at really high temperatures, um, uh, low oxygen, et cetera. Um, but that is not why we go underground. So I have an animation that I'd like you to watch for a moment. And let's just go ahead and watch it. So you see all these white things coming down. That is not precipitation. It's not snow, it's not rain, it's not precipitation. You notice that these white things, when they hit the surface there's of the earth, there seems to be fewer of them. And then in our animation, it looks like a few of those little white dots, only a very, very few of them make it way down deep. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of context. Those two white things on the surface, those are called head frames. And this is not well to scale because those head frames, those two white buildings are actually about um, three quarters of a mile apart. And those red lines are shafts. So uh, they are holes from the surface and they make their way down about 5,000 feet, 4,850 feet below the surface, okay? So those two head frames are where people would actually get on, I'm gonna call it the elevator for now, and travel underground. But let's go back to the question about those white things. Well, those white things are representing um, subatomic particles, primarily cosmic rays. And these cosmic rays are coming from outer space, coming from our sun, and they're constantly bombarding the surface of the earth. So everybody take your hand, hold your hand out. Pew! 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 So probably every two to three seconds, one of those cosmic rays is actually passing through your hand. You don't feel it, you don't notice it, doesn't really do anything to you. But if you are our scientists and you are searching for really elusive, teeny tiny, almost impossible to find uh, particles of matter, all this cosmic radiation is just noise. It's just all that's noise. And so if they put their detectors, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, if they put their detectors on the surface 
and then tried to find these particles that they're searching for, it would be kind of like trying to hear a pin drop at a rock concert. There's just too much noise. So we travel a mile underground and we use that mile of rock overburden to essentially shield us and our detectors from all those cosmic rays, all that cosmic radiation. So now imagine you got on our elevator, you rode down for a mile, you're now underground and you hold your hand out and you're waiting for a cosmic ray. Well, you probably wait two to three months Instead of having one pass through you every two to three seconds, that mile of rock overburdened has rid us of most all of the cosmic radiation. So our scientists say it's so much quieter, cosmically quieter, nearly a mile underground. It's about 10 million times quieter. All right, so that's why we go underground. Now, there are other experiments that don't require that shielding that also operate in our underground space for a variety of reasons. But the main reason is to use that rock as a shield for that cos those cosmic rays. So here's a question. What does that underground space look like? All right, so I have two pictures here. The first picture, uh, the larger one, is the entrance to our Davis campus. So if you rode our elevator um, underground and you got off at the 4850 level, so 4850 feet below, if you got off at the 4850 level, you would um, be close to the Davis campus. And you'll, you'll notice the Davis campus. First of all, that Davis campus is named for a guy by the name of Ray Davis. And around here, Ray Davis is a hero. So Ray Davis won the Nobel Prize in Physics in the year 2002 for an experiment that he did here on site. Now he did that experiment in the 60s and 70s when this was still the home state gold mine. But his experiment, the research that he did and what he learned uh, by operating his experiment in this same general space, won him the Nobel Prize in physics in the year 2002. So the Davis campus is named for Ray. Um, you'll notice that you're now nearly a mile underground You'll see that there's plumbing. You'll see that there's lights. Uh, there's great ventilation. The temperature, um, the air conditioning keeps you right in the nice 70 degree range. Yes, there's Wi-Fi in the Davis campus. There's actually a Panini press, um, all the comforts of home. Uh, so that is uh, the laboratory space. However, remember I said that there's about 370 miles worth of space underground. Much of it is, um, it is not updated or modernized uh, in much of any way. If you look at the other picture, you'll notice on the walls, there's mesh and what are called rock bolts. So any place that people are going to be, um, we put this mesh up. We extra secure the rock with these long, long rock bolts. Uh, and then even in the Davis campus, you'll see all the white. They spray the walls with something called shotcrete um, and to, to make that space just absolutely as safe as it possibly can be. Um, the question that my students always ask, what about bathrooms? Oh yes, of course. Um, in, in the modernized space, we have modern bathrooms. In the not so modernized space, you got your, you know, your awesome uh, porta potty. Uh, okay, so that's what the space looks like. So the next question might be, well, I keep talking about this elevator thing, 
but this elevator thing has to haul people um, down a mile and then back up a mile. And do you see all of that equipment that's in that second picture? All of that equipment has to go down the shaft and up the shaft as well. So one of the things that I hope that you take away from this is that surf is an engineering marvel. So this picture is a picture from our hoist room. Uh, and the hoist room is, is pretty incredible because this engineering design was actually engineered and designed in the 1930s. And that technology really operates to this day. And so what you're looking at are these giant drums that the rope that's going to haul that elevator up and down a mile, that that rope coils around. And there's very specific reasons for why those drums are designed the way that they are. Uh, but our hoists uh, have been safely operating since the 1930s. Now, are there, is there refurbishment? Of course, is there modernization? Of course, but the basic design has been around since the 1930s. Um, I'm just thinking about what I wanna say. So I've mentioned the elevator. Well, we don't call it an elevator. Uh, we call it the cage. Uh, and the cage is what you're looking at on the right. And that is um, the space, the compartment uh, that people are transported from the surface to the underground and then back at multiple times a day. The gentleman that you see over on the left, uh, he is a cage operator. You'll notice uh, what he is wearing. Prior to COVID, if I had said PPE to you, you might be like, I don't know what that means. But of course, our personal protective uh, equipment. And so our cage operator and every single person that goes underground must wear a hard, hamp, hard hat, a safety lamp, safety goggles, coveralls, and steel-toed boots. So that's the equipment, that's the PPE that everybody dresses in every day. And since COVID, this was one of our biggest challenges. So our cage is really quite small. I think it's about six feet by eight feet. Uh, and it's a 12 minute ride to the underground and it's super expensive. Think about the amount of energy it would take to lower and to raise that. So in the past, we've wanted to put as many people into that cage at one time as possible. Um, so with COVID now, uh, in addition to the other PPE, uh, you're going to wear a, um, a half mask, uh, a half respirator. Uh, you're going to wear gloves, et cetera, um, for that 12 minute uh, ride. Uh, SURF has been very particular and careful about COVID protocols. And so getting to the underground uh, for this last year has been that much more challenging. So I think I'd like to take you on a trip to the underground. So imagine for a moment uh, that you've now walked into the cage, you're wearing your PPE, you've turned your headlamp on because there's, uh, there's not light inside the cage itself. And so you've got your headlamp turned on so you can see a little bit. Uh, and we're about ready to work our way to the 4850 level. I'm gonna take that volume down on that. So we actually uh, slung a camera underneath uh, the, um, uh, the cage itself so that you can see. Uh, and this is the shaft. And this shaft literally goes by almost 5,000 feet um, um, from the surface to the 4850 level. 
Uh, we have crews that perform what's called top-down maintenance, which means that they're constantly checking and fixing all of that, all of that support, cleaning out the muck, et cetera, uh, so that this, this is a super safe ride. The trip itself is 12 minutes, as I mentioned. So you get on for 12 minutes, you chat with your friends in the cage, and then you work your way underground. So that's the trip. Um, and so that's another engineering design wonder for sure. So another challenge of working in underground space. That challenge is water. Water is a problem. Um, there are many amazing engineering wonders that surf, but probably one of the most interesting and important is our um, water mitigation, our pumping system. So about 650 gallons of water infiltrates into the lab each, well, not into the lab, but into the underground space each and every day. And if we didn't stay ahead of it, it wouldn't be too terribly long before that water filled up the underground space uh, all the way above where the 4850 level is. In fact, when uh, the mine was shut down, the pumps were turned off. And so water filled up much of that underground space. It took literally years to pump the water out to the point where um, we could begin to, to build the laboratory facility. So um, we have a series of pumping stations throughout the underground that bring that water back up to the surface. But when it comes back up to the surface, it has infiltrated and picked up all sorts of minerals. It is not clean, pure water any longer, and it's hot because believe it or not, at 5,000 feet underground, the, uh, the rock wall itself is hot. And so we bring that water up to the surface. Our wastewater treatment plant um, cleans up the water. And then eventually that water is um, discharged into Gold Run Creek. The wastewater treatment plant at SURF for the last 12 years has been awarded um, Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources, Outstanding Operation and Environmental Compliance. We take that role extremely seriously. We wanna be not just a good neighbor, but a great neighbor. Uh, the picture on the lower right that looks like a waterfall actually is the water that's being discharged from uh, our wastewater treatment plant. It flows down this hill. Everybody stops and takes pictures of it because they think it's a natural waterfall, but then that water actually flows into Gold Run Creek. It's beautifully clean. Um, we test the water in the creek. We do um, uh, tests with Department of um, Environment and Natural Resources on fish, et cetera, just to make sure we're not just compliant, but really, really good neighbors. All right, so that's the, um, the short version, the super, super short version of um, the challenges associated uh, with uh, working underground. Now what I wanna do is actually turn to the science. So the universe is made up of matter. And I was a chemistry teacher for years and I talked all about matter. Matter is all that stuff that makes up particles and stars and planets and you and me and a banana and your desk, the oxygen we breathe, that's matter. And we know quite a bit about matter. Here's the problem. The matter that we know and understand in our universe actually really only makes up about 4% of all that we know is out there, but that we know almost nothing about. So the rest of it, we call it dark matter and dark energy, not because they're black, but because we don't know much of anything about it. We know it's there, 
Um, there's, there's a ton um, of, of data that tells us that there's this stuff that's out there that we haven't yet been able to detect. And at SURF, what we are doing, um, one of the experiments that um, will go online here very shortly is called LZ, Lux Zeppelin. And that experiment is again a mile underground because dark matter's, <laughs> well, so far undetectable, but we're hoping, crossing our fingers, that, that our hypothesis of how we might be able to detect it is correct. And so LZ is about ready to go online and start taking, um, collecting data uh, in a hope that we will actually be able to see the signal of dark matter. And friends, this is Nobel Prize worthy, right? Like we know it's out there, but we know absolutely nothing about it. Very likely the first experiment that actually um, identifies some properties or characteristics or can tell us a little bit about what dark matter is, that's Nobel Prize worthy for sure. So we're super excited about uh, LZ. And like I said, it's about to go online um, here yet this, this year. So the other thing that we're, uh, we've got a, some experiments about um, are neutrinos. Neutrinos are a fundamental particle of matter. It's actually the most abundant particle of matter. Think about this. You literally have a thousand trillion neutrinos passing through your body every second. A thousand trillion every second. Hmm. That means there's a lot of them and they must be really, really, really small. Um, they're, they're almost undetectable, but we can detect them. Um, actually, Ray Davis's experiment that he won the Nobel Prize for um, was about properties of neutrinos. We know that there are three types of neutrinos. Uh, and we're looking, uh, physicists call them three flavors of neutrinos, and we're looking to understand more about them. So the largest experiment ever attempted on North American soil is being constructed, or in what's called pre-excavation, right now here at SURF. And what's really pretty cool about it is that it has a pretty significant and major connection between SURF and you all in the Chicago area. And so I'm gonna, um, I can't do the story justice. And so I'm gonna uh, quickly show you a video clip that is produced by Fermilab uh, because Fermi is our partner in this giant uh, experiment that uh, we're gearing up for. So the, uh, the experiment is known as LBNF Dune, Long Baseline Neutrino Facility, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Uh, and I'm gonna play the video here in a second, but here's me right here in South Dakota, and here's you all near Fermilab in Chicago. All right, so play the video. Oh, let me make sure that the, vol the volume is back up. Okay, here we go. Thirteen point eight billion years ago, the universe started with the Big Bang. Energy transformed into matter and antimatter. But what happened next? According to discoveries made by Albert Einstein and other physicists, the Big Bang must have produced equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Yet the stars and galaxies we see across the universe are all made of matter. What happened? Why did matter win over antimatter? A new experiment aims to find out whether tiny particles called neutrinos might be the reason. Neutrinos are the most abundant matter particles in the universe, 
Trillions pass through us and everything else in the universe every second. They are produced in huge quantities in our sun and other stars, and in smaller quantities inside our Earth. Even bananas emit neutrinos. Scientists can produce neutrinos and antineutrinos with particle accelerators and study their properties in great detail. The deep underground neutrino experiment, DUNE, will test whether neutrinos and their antimatter counterparts behave differently. The experiment will be housed in the Long Baseline Neutrino Facility and use a particle accelerator at the Department of Energy's Fermilab. It will create the intense beam of particles that travel 1,300 kilometers through the Earth to the Sanford Underground Research Facility. Dune scientists will build enormous, super-sensitive particle detectors while advancing state-of-the-art technologies. The detectors, located 1.5 kilometers underground, will catch neutrinos and antineutrinos as they arrive at Sanford Lab. The differences in the particles' behavior during their four millisecond trip from Illinois to South Dakota will tell scientists whether neutrinos could be the reason that the universe is made of matter. But Dune can discover even more. If a star explodes in our Milky Way galaxy, the Dune detectors will be able to see neutrinos from that explosion here on Earth. That will allow scientists to watch how the supernova leads to the formation of a neutron star, and possibly a black hole. The Dune detectors can even look for particle tracks from proton decay. Many theoretical models predict protons are unstable, but fortunately for us, the average lifetime of a proton is very long, more than 100,000 billion 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 years. However, a proton could decay at any given moment. If scientists observe it, they'll narrow down their models, moving closer to Einstein's dream of finding a unified theory of matter and energy. From neutrinos to black holes to proton decay, the discoveries made by the inter Sorry about that. Um, she basically says the discoveries made are really awesome. Um, my apologies. 13.8 billion go years. Oh, well, every uh, presentation has to have one technology goof. That's, that was my bad. Um, so LBNF Dune. This is an incredibly huge uh, project that we are, uh, I would say we're still in its infancy. Um, what's amazing to me about this is it is truly an international collaboration. There are about um, uh, 1,230 collaborators from over 200 institutions around the world, 33 different nations are involved in this collaboration. Um, CERN uh, in Switzerland actually had the prototype, prototype for Dune, a smaller scale version. Uh, this is, um, it's the first internationally conceived, constructed and operated eventually mega science project and it hosted by the uh, US Department of Energy. It's pretty exciting. exciting. Um, So the detectors that we will need for Dune have not yet been constructed. Uh, and what they will require is they will actually require us over the next several years to excavate 800,000, in excess of 800,000 ton of rock to create these enormous caverns underground. I'm going to actually, I think I'll use my uh, laser pointer for a second. So here's the 4850 level. Um, and this little yellow box over here is that Davis campus. Um, uh, uh, actually, no, it's not the Davis campus over here. Sorry about that. Um, this, uh, this is uh, at the other head frame. We're going to excavate here. That rock doesn't stay underground. So 800,000 ton of rock it's going to have to be removed from the underground. We'll bring it to the surface uh, and then it'll be crushed. It'll go through a conveyor system. That conveyor actually right now has been constructed over the highway. 
Um, and then uh, it, the rock, the removed rock will be deposited uh, into what's called the open cut, which is a, a, a relic of the early days of um, uh, gold mining. Uh, so that excavation process is just about to get underway. We've been in pre-excavation and getting ready for, the, for excavation for several years already. Um, and then it will be several years uh, of excavation before the detectors are assembled, before data collection can actually begin. Let me get rid of that laser pointer. So I think it's important always to mention economic impact. Uh, and this particular sh slide shows the long-term economic impact in both South Dakota and in Illinois. Nearly in, over the course of the entire uh, pre-excavation, excavation and experiment, um, nearly a billion dollars uh, of economic impact in South Dakota and well over a billion dollars of economic impact in Illinois. Um, many jobs created over this time. A lot of those jobs are not necessarily experimenters or researchers, but it is those people that are on site doing the hard work, the engineering, the designing, the excavating uh, here at, uh, at SURF. So that's just a little bit about the science, a little bit of economic impact. And where I want to go is um, about SURF's mission and vision. I love the mission and I love the vision. Uh, that we have here at SURF. So we advance world-class science. Absolutely, we are a user facility with the, with the goal of advancing that world-class science. And we work to inspire learning across generations from those earliest learners, our kindergarten, kindergartners, all the way through our local community members, people like you. We wanna inspire learning across generations. Our vision is that we, we believe we are, but we absolutely strive to be the world's preferred location for underground science and science education. So it is, it is about the science for sure, but it is about more than that. It is also about our future scientists, our, um, uh, our future uh, um, and those that those people that are involved uh, in our communities right now. So I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes talking about the educational landscape in South Dakota. Um, I love South Dakota. Uh, it is rich in many respects. Uh, beautiful landscapes from flat prairies to the Black Hills, the badlands in between. Um, diverse cultures. Um, it may not seem like it, but we actually, there's, there's a lot of diversity in terms of both um, uh, socioeconomic diversity, racial diversity, um, historic diversity. And there exists wide and persistent disparities in our educational opportunities and outcomes. It is the reality. Um, American Indian students in South Dakota represent our largest, and I'm going to call it underserved population. The majority of our American Indians in South Dakota um, are affiliated with one of our nine tribes living on one of, uh, oftentimes living near or on one of those nine reservations. About 15% of our student population is American Indian. And very distressingly, the graduation rate um, disparity between our American Indian students uh, and our white students is, is, is large. It's a big gap. Um, issues of poverty, racism, low expectations, mistrust, disenfranchisement, and geographic isolation really all contribute um, to, that, to those disparities, to those inequities to those um, lacks of opportunity. And so um, I think this is an interesting statistic that you may struggle with a little bit, especially out here in Western South Dakota. 
um, much of our population lives in places where the population density is less than two residents per square mile. I'm sure that's really almost unimaginable for some of you. And that sparse population and, and a geographic isolation really impacts teachers, um, the remoteness, they have few opportunities for teacher professional development, and there's not a lot of infrastructure in place for supports. So with some of those elements in place, our education and outreach team, uh, we have our own mission and vision. And that is that we believe firmly that every student deserves high quality, engaging, relevant, equitable, and rigorous science learning opportunities. That's setting a high bar. And so we feel that we need to bring our A game uh, to support um, and realize uh, that goal. And so we wanna inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers, but more than that, we want every student in our state to develop their identity as capable science learners. That doesn't mean we want every single last one of them to be uh, uh, scientists, but rather we want every single student to believe that if they wanna be one, they absolutely can be. And to develop that identity, they have to have those engaging, high quality, relevant, rigorous, and equitable science learning opportunities. So what can SURF do? We create curriculum that's connected to the science here at SURF. We leverage the unsettled science. We create this curriculum, and then we put that curriculum together with all of the tools and resources necessary to teach the curriculum. We put it into kits and we send it out to any teacher in South Dakota that asks for it for free. Each curriculum unit is five to 15 hours of students getting to do hands-on, minds-on figuring out of science learning. And as I said, all of it's free to our teachers. All they have to do is request it. Um, our curriculum units um, over the last few years have been used by about 15,000 students in the state. That may not seem like a lot, but in sparsely populated South Dakota, we think that that's a big win. In addition, we go into classrooms and we try to do engaging, fun um, presentations. And over the last few years, we've done those for about 34,000 students. In non-COVID times, uh, we also brought students here to the site and we did field, trip, field trips. You know, well over 56, probably actually, we're probably getting to 57, 58,000 students um, that we've connected with over the past few years. Um, COVID has radically changed our work. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, I mean, COVID hit, we shut down, we didn't know what to do. We have learned this virtual world. We've created uh, 360 degree virtual field trips. The students can go virtually underground. Uh, they can go to our wastewater treatment plant. They can see that hoist room in action. Uh, and we now do presentations uh, for teachers and students across the state and frankly now across the country and I suppose potentially across the world. And again, all of those are free. They're free for any teacher that requests it. Um, we feel so strongly that our mission is to provide uh, this support to teachers and to learners. <laughs> so every summer we do teacher professional development. And boy, we had a lot of teacher professional development scheduled for last summer. Uh, we had 200 teachers that were planning to attend uh, our professional development and then COVID hit and we had to pivot quickly. We actually wound up with more teachers attending because they didn't have to drive uh, to lead South Dakota to attend our professional development. About 300 teachers last uh, summer. We did 37 days of virtual professional development. I think we actually even figured out how to do Zoom professional development, Zoom all day long in an engaging, pretty powerful way. I, I feel very strongly that it was quite successful. This next summer, 
we're going to do a mixture of both face to face and uh, virtual because one of the things we've learned is that there are advantages to, to, to virtual. So we support students, we support teachers, and we work hard to uh, support our post-secondary. We have a summer intern program. We bring um, in summer interns in, pay them in communications, engineering, safety, science, uh, and education. So um, uh, quite a wide variety of students get opportunities to be interns. And then we have this program called the Davis Bacall. Yes, Ray Davis. Um, the Davis Bacall program brings eight students each year uh, out to the Black Hills. They travel between here and Chicago visiting uh, STEM industry and research, etc. They get to Fermilab, they have some experiences at Fermilab, they jump on a plane and they go to Italy and visit another underground lab at Gran Sasso, and then they return home. Now this year we're doing something different. Um, we're not planning on going to Italy this year, uh, but that is another opportunity for our post-secondary students to explore what's my passion in that realm of STEM. Lastly, um, for our adult learners. Every year we have a science festival here in Leeds. It's called Neutrino Day. Um, when it's face to face, we have, you know, several thousand people that come and visit and they um, see concerts and they, uh, there are experimenters and there are activities for kids. And last year we went virtual. Uh, we produced over 17 hours of content. Uh, there were people from 20 different countries that, that participated in Neutrino Day. We also have a lecture series, a little bit like what you're um, experiencing right now. We call it Deep Talks. It um, happens once a month. It used to be face-to-face. -face. Now it's virtual. My guess is when it goes back to face-to-face, there will be a virtual component. Um, we have a newsletter. Uh, so we're reaching out to our commu community, both locally, regionally, and globally. Uh, because we want everyone to stay connected, uh, to be learners, to inspire that learning across generations. So all of what I've been talking about, the, uh, the K-12, the Davis Bacall, the um, intern program, uh, the adult learning experiences, all of that is provided to users for free. Uh, and we realized that we want to do more, we want to do better. Uh, and so we've stood up a foundation. Um, one of the things we're building is we're actually building an ethnobotanical garden. Um, that ethnobotanical garden is going to be designed to honor um, uh, and have native plants, um, to honor um, our indigenous uh, community uh, and the, the history that is the Black Hills. Um, and then in addition to the ethnobotanical garden, we have this um, plan for the future of uh, what we're calling right now the Surf Institute, which will bring scientists and researchers and educators and kids together uh, in, in one site. A pretty exciting future. And of course, we want to expand our education and our public outreach opportunities. So we've stood up the foundation. We're, we're beginning that process. So I leave you with um, a sunrise picture of Sanford Underground Research Facility. You can see the two white buildings are our two head frames. Underneath there are our shafts that take us to the 4850 level. In between that, we have the community of Leeds, South Dakota and looking out at the beautiful Black Hills. With that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to sh for sharing a little bit about SURF. If you'd like to know more, if you'd like to know more about our education programs, our public outreach, our foundation, the science at SURF, you can visit um, www.sanfordlab.org. And with that, Wendy, I am finished.
Wendy, are you with me? I am. I'm <laughs> trying to, I successfully removed myself and now I'm trying to get myself back on uh, start video. There we go. Lovely. That was so interesting. Well, thank you. It's really a pretty interesting place. I'm not going to lie. So interesting. We have all kinds of questions and I have a bunch of questions also. All right. um, so in the, uh, the chat we had before uh, we got on camera, I said to you that one thing I was curious about was um, claustrophobia. Does anybody? Yes. And uh, looking at the cage, well, first of all, is there only one cage or is there more than? Um, so there are the two white buildings Yes. So there's the Ross and the Yates. And each of those has one cage that is used to transport people. Uh, and then there are there, there's other things for transporting materials, etc. Um, but there's one cage at the Ross and one cage at the Yates. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, have people come down with <laughs> claustrophobia yeah panic um, attacks whatever yeah so um i haven't heard very many stories about that but i will tell you that and this is pre-covid times um we're talking six feet by eight feet so not a lot of space right um technically we could put 36 people in that space um, I've been in there with 24 and 24, you're pretty much standing right here and your next friend is like right here. Um, we've reduced that number during COVID times, but it's super expensive and a, and a long trip. And so we, we still need to maximize, <laughs> maximize the number of individuals. So it gets cozy, um, but for the most part, it's the same people or mostly the same people every day up and down. Uh, and so you just chat with your friends on the way down or if it's really early in the morning, you just kind of zone out. Okay. Um. <laughs> my, my first trip um, underground, I was, I would say a little bit apprehensive um, just because you're, it, it's, so, it's so new, like you don't know what to expect. Um, but once you've done it once, it's like, oh, well, that's really not that. I mean, it's cool. I'm going a mile underground, but uh, it's it's no longer scary. Do your ears pop? Uh, some people's do. Um, uh, we have a question about how much oxygen is there underground? Do you need? Oh, did... we, um, we have the, a great ventilation system, a great, great, great ventilation system. Uh, and we have these huge, enormous fans. Uh, and then all these different air doors to make sure that there's a constant, really great flow of air. And actually our shafts serve as inflow and outflow of that, of that air. There are places it actually feels windy because of that airflow. Um, we also have uh, monitors that monitor things like what's the oxygen level um, in the underground. And it's not, um, we have great air. I mean, and, and that's not true for every underground space. We have great air. Okay. And um, along with monitoring air, I'm guessing you have smoke detectors. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, we actually monitor for a number, uh, number of different things, you know, carbon monoxide, et cetera, um, methane. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's a there's a, a very sophisticated fire suppression system underground. We also have something called a refuge chamber that if, if there were a horrible event, that there would be a place that people could take refuge until they would be able to be rescued out of the underground. So, and that's stocked with oxygen and food and water, games, you know. <laughs> Porta potty. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um. Do you have a cafeteria? We do not. Um, and so uh, when, uh, um, so one of the things that's kind of interesting, when you, take a, when you take a cage ride, if you're late, you're not going underground. Like <laughs> they don't wait for this. The cage goes at 1130. The cage goes at 630. Um, 
Uh, How many people are... work work in the lab? Well, so we have 188 employees. Many of those employees are on the surface. Many of them are support. Many of them are safety, security, et cetera. Um, and then we have our underground technicians, et cetera. So um, those cages go up and down. They're, it's busy. Um, do you get like a slot? Of, yes, like you absolutely do. You absolutely get a slot. Like you're going to be on the 6.30 a.m. cage and you're going to, you're going to come up at lunch or you're not going to come up at lunch. And so you have your lunch with you when you go underground. Okay. I, I'm surprised because you talked about how expensive it is. I'm surprised people are allowed to come up for lunch. Well, but. I would say that mostly people are coming up at, uh, at, at the, on the 11.30 cage because um, they're, they only need to be underground for the morning. Got it. Yeah. Um, and I guess if you, can you switch your spot with someone? If, if, you... yeah, if there's an open spot on a cage, I suppose, yeah. God, that's so crazy. Um... Yeah, it's a great story to tell students though, because like if you're late <laughs> and you're an hourly employee, <laughs> you're not going to work. I, yeah. yeah, I, I mean, yeah. I'm just thinking like I've heard, um, you know, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. People used to commute to New York from the Poconos, which okay. is yep. a very long bus ride. It's multiple hours each way. And, um, but this is a very unusual commute. It's, it's just different. Yeah, it's, it's different. different. Kind of yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, is the video with regard to the LBNF Dune available on YouTube? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And Vimeo, um, I would do, I would just do a YouTube search or a Vimeo search for LB and Dune. Okay, great. Yep. Um, Fermi's lab, uh, Fermi lab website will have it, I'm sure. Um, I'm and sure. you can also, I'll get the address, the uh, links from you and I'll include yeah, it in the absolutely. follow-up. Yep. Um, what is the estimated completion time for the LB and Dune? Oh, so, so COVID's been problematic. <laughs> Like, I know that that's like stating the obvious. Um, and, and they're just, uh, there's a lot of challenges associated with it. So it's, um, it's, an, it's, the experiment itself will probably run for 10 years. So the whole, the whole thing, this is one of my favorite things to tell students when I go out, is I tell them about LBNF Dune, and then say, you could work on this project because we're in pre-excavation, then there's excavation, then there's detector building, et cetera. And then probably the experiment itself is gonna run for 10 plus years. So we're talking, this is, this is a long-term, long, long-term. Right, do they, do, is there an estimate of how long it's going to take to do the pre-excavation? Well, we're actually just about done with pre-excavation. We're gonna start moving rock here in the next few months. Um, and so then we'll be in excavation where we're actually excavating those giant caverns that friends, we're talking football fields in length and, and stories high, giant caverns a mile underground. Like crazy. It is crazy. How are the large pieces of equipment lowered? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. Um, so, you know, like the ship in a bottle thing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, the really, really big pieces, they, they're taken apart on the surface. Oh, and they put them together. Down underground. Down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, um, and so then they have to be small enough to either fit in a cage or on a skip. Or in a few cases, they're slung under the cage they're hung from the underside of the cage oh um and lowered uh, lower down the um the uh, i can't even imagine how that happens like the uh, wouldn't that just drop the whole cage oh gosh no 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 our cage our hoist operators are amazing people that actually maneuver i mean because our cage can stop literally within a few inches of where you want it to stop over the course of nearly 5,000 feet. And so we don't just stop at the 4850 level. Are there, um, 
other, is it like Bloomingdale's for <laughs> lingerie and women's, women's clothes? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so there are a few other levels um, where there's some work being done. It's, um, it's not a modernized space, but uh, some of the research on like the extremophiles um, where we're looking for those critters that live in these extreme environments. Um, we also have a. Um, and when you say when you say critters, are yep. you talking about like actual little animals, or are we still talking um, particles? No, 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 living things. Okay. Yeah, they just happen to be really, really small. You know, okay. so like bacteria type. Got it. Um, we have um, we have astrobiologists who are interested in the the critters that can live here because if they can live in our extreme environments maybe they can live other places not on this planet yeah yeah uh we have a couple of questions about who is or was uh sanford and it, oh it, yeah okay so it's without the, the, it's it's, it's, it's without it's, the t it's s-a-s-a-n not s-t-a-n right it's sanford okay. s-a-n-f-o-r-d so T. Denny Sanford, he's alive, um, and he, he made a whole lot of money in South Dakota in business, in finance, in banking, um, and he has been very generous philanthropically. Is he um, the $70 million? Yes. Uh, phil yes. Ah. yes. yes. Um, yeah, if you give $70 million, we'll probably put your name on the building. So if there's anybody out there, this whole surf institute we want to build, like it could have a name, just saying. <laughs> okay. Um, Nancy says, did Deb mention that there is a Neutrino Day newsletter? I went to- uh, Oh, so we have Neutrino Day. And that is the second Saturday in July. And that's our festival. Um, but we also have a newsletter called Deep uh, Thoughts. Uh, and Deep, well, we have Deep Thoughts and we also have Deep Talks. So Deep Thoughts um, is, uh, is produced every week. And it's stories about the experiments and the engineering and the people that work here, et cetera. Um, Folks, and you can I'll, actually I'll, sign I'll... up. I'll uh, include for, all these links in yeah. the, the follow-up. Yep. Um, is someone asks, it's, is there still public access today? If someone wants to. Oh, so um, uh, SURF itself does not have public access on site. Um, and even, uh, even pre-COVID times, you can't you can't just drive up here. You um, There's a guard shack and, and, and check in. However, there is the Sanford um, Lab Homestake Visitor Center, which um, celebrates the history of the mine and also the, the science. Um, and so there's the visitor center. Uh, and during the summer, they actually have a trolley that you can hop on and then the trolley will come up and drive around and you can see the head frames and those kinds of things. You can actually, uh, from the trolley, uh, they'll take you into the hoist room where those giant drums are that um, that hoist the, the cages. Um, okay. Um, when you showed the, I think it's the hoist room with that big coil. Yes. The, those, the, the, yep. Is that metal? Are those, are those... the ropes? Yes. Essentially. I mean, they're, um, they're about, they're about this big around. Um, and they have a, a more um, uh, a center that's a, that, that has some give to it, but then they're metal around the outside of it. Got it. Um, okay. I actually should have grabbed, we have a piece of one just in the other room. I should have grabbed it and, and shown you a piece of it. It's, they're quite, it's quite heavy. I, undoubtedly, that was a... Yeah, big, we actually... Um, just recently, for the first time since SURF has been operating, we actually replaced the entire rope on the, on the loss um, just in the last few months. How do they do that? Uh, you know, I didn't get to see it happen. I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I can even quite imagine it myself. Because nobody would be able to go in or out while that's taking place. So, so it's, it's actually two buildings. So there's the building that has the hoist itself. And then there's another building over here that actually 
is the head frame where the cage is. Um, and the, the rope goes outside and over a giant uh, pulley um, and then down. And so, yeah, I mean, so then the cage Oh, that's, off. okay. Oh, yeah. I thought you were talking about the one that's all coiled up. Oh yeah, so that, so that, so that rope um, comes up with the cage and then goes across from one building to the other and then it coils onto um, the giant drum. Yep. And the coiling is super cool so that it never ever, so the rope never crosses itself. So it never rubs on itself. It each groove um, so that it never, it really never touches. And, and designed in the 1930s. I, I, yeah, it's, it's mind boggling. It's, it is, it is mind boggling. Um, but what, um, what I love about it is bringing people and then talking about all of the, the problem solving and the design challenges that are necessary to make a place like this operate, whether it's a gold mine or whether it's a research facility. Okay. Um, I've gotten several questions about earthquakes. <laughs> no, uh, basically no. I mean, South Dakota is very seismically inactive. Um, we're way more likely to have a tornado. <laughs> and we have protocols in place for what we do if there's a tornado warning. Uh, but you'd be underground. Why would, why would you? Well, but what if you're on your way up or down? Oh, right. Yeah, good point, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, high winds, thunderstorms, tornadoes, all of those things, we have protocols in place. Safety first. Safety first. Um, do you have a nurse on duty or yes, a doctor? Yes, do. we do. Um, we have a, a occupational, essentially. Um, and then we have a, um, a um, what are called ERTs, emergency response team, um, that we don't need to use, but we have them. And they, uh, they've been really, at, they've been really helpful with our um, health screenings uh, for COVID. <laughs> okay. Uh, back in the day when I used to work in a building um, with other people, mm -hmm. uh, we would have fire safety drills once or twice a year. Sure. Do you do that also? Oh yeah. So, well, so we have like, we have surface drills of different kinds. Um, we have underground ac ac uh, evacuation drills. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, safety between first. between the two white buildings, yep. um, can people walk between them? So it um, there's a there's 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 a giant valley in between. Um, it, I mean, you're in the Black Hills, in the beautiful Black Hills, mountain, mountain, beautiful valley in between. I mean, you can you can drive around. You could walk the road around. Sure. Oh, but um, I mean, but a, under. A, but underground? Oh, underground, yes, absolutely. Yep, the, the Ross is uh, connected to the to the Yates. We have a um, underground tramway system as well. I saw the so tracks. Yep, right. yep, yep. What about like if somebody wanted to bring their bicycle or roller skate yep. or something? No, no. Okay. Nope, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> safety first. <laughs> yeah, safety first. Okay. Um, what about air pressure? Someone is asking, do people get rickets? No. Okay. Um, air pressures is interesting. I mean, everybody has um, slightly different experiences, um, but, the, but air, air pressure is not significantly different. Okay. Uh, here's an interesting question. Are there separate rooms for working? Um, uh, I mean, this is like all the spaces are so for research or yep, yep. Um, and the the space is tight. Like um, again, outfitting an underground laboratory, the space is pretty tight, and so there is the the space for LZ Lux Zeppelin, our um, dark matter experiment. Um, there's a space for Myrana, which is a, a, a smaller neutrino experiment. There's a space for what's called the Black Hills Underground Campus, which uh, what's great about that is that a lot of undergraduates get to do some research. Um, and, and that's kind of a unique experience. Um, and so, and then there's, 
kind of a hallway where we have tables and stuff set up so that you can pull out your laptop and do some work, you know. Wow. But it's cozy. Uh, yeah. Um, Melinda is asking, are teacher in services open to science teachers outside of South Dakota? Ooh, good question. Um, or even non-science elementary teachers. So, oh, so first of all, every elementary teacher is a science teacher. Every elementary teacher is a science teacher. And okay. we firmly, if, if anything, we wanna support our elementary science teachers because we want those students to develop that science learner identity when they're little. And sometimes our elementary teachers don't feel super confident in teaching, in teaching science. So we wanna support them as much as possible. Um, in terms of whether it's open to teachers outside of South Dakota, my answer is in theory. Um, however, uh, they tend to fill up super fast and we, because of some of our funding mechanisms uh, and because we wanna pay our teachers to attend, um, uh, we would prioritize our teachers and we frankly even prioritize our rural teachers and our tribal school teachers over um, our student, our teachers that are in larger districts. Okay. Um, sorry, Melinda. I know you wanted to go. Well, Melinda, you, you reach out to me. We'll see what we can do. Okay. That's good. Uh, Susan is asking, please talk about some of the geological research. Mm, do you do any? I don't know that you, yes, um, but that would not be my area of expertise and I would basically be making things up. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, we'll keep moving. Um, can you elaborate about what you're specifically doing um, to help Native American children? Yeah, so um, in, uh, in our education and outreach work, uh, we are, um, our curriculum units are designed specifically for those uh, rural schools and our reservation schools uh, where they have limited access to resources, materials, colleagues, et cetera. Um, and so uh, we're working hard to make those connections between our, our tribal schools, our reservation schools, our public schools that have high Native American populations. Um, and then in addition to that, when we look at summer interns, when we look at our Davis Bacall scholars, um, we want our, um, our population uh, of those students to represent the population of South Dakota. Okay. Is Ray Davis still alive? No, he is not. Okay. He passed away in, I think, 06, if I remember correctly. Did he ever come visit? Well, so he was here on site. No, um, I mean, oh, like, after. Yes. Um, so I do not believe so. I believe, and I could be wrong about this, but I believe that he died of Alzheimer's. Oh, uh, I think terrible. I'm right on that. And, and, and I, I probably shouldn't have even said that because I'm not positive. Um, but uh, he was quite elderly when he won the Nobel Prize and died just a few years later. Okay. Um, Richard is asking, um, he says, I visited the Sudan retired iron mine in Minnesota that was used for some years by Fermi Lab for neutrino research. Mm -hmm. Under half a mile of rock and iron is SURF LBNF Dune the next generation of this research? Um, so is it the next generation? I'm not sure that I would call it the next generation, but, but, but maybe because in, in essence, we're, we're continuing to try to learn as much as we possibly can about neutrinos. Um, and certainly at Sudan, there were, there was neutrino e e experiments that happened. I'm not familiar with exactly what the neutrino experience experiments were. Um, but um, there, are, there are quite a number of neutrino experiments out there because these things are so darn little um, and we know so little about them and yet we believe they hold the key to why we're here. Like why matter exists and therefore why does life exist? Okay, that's the answer to the next question. Why do humans really need to know what dark matter is, what particles mean for us? Um, okay. So, so that's, I mean, that, that's part of, that's part of it. 
Um, there's always also that what's the next question that we don't know the answer to. So, and sometimes we, when we do research, we don't know immediately what it's going to be used for, um, but we learn and, uh, and at some later point, we, we're like, oh, well we could um, because of something we learned in the past. So we don't know why we need to know it entirely yet. We just know that we don't know. Okay. Um, here are two short um, personal um, comments. Harriet says the Cajun shaft are very similar to the Cajun shaft we rode at the Stratica salt mines in Hutchinson, Kansas. Mm. We only went down 650 feet though, the dark matter, et cetera. Does that somewhat compare on totally different scale to what used to be at the Super Collider in Waco, Texas? I, I don't know the answer to that. I like I don't, uh, the dark matter detector would not be like what was at Waco because this is a, I mean, this is new technology for sure. Okay. Um, and then this is from Roberta. My mother grew up at the Maitland mine and graduated from Deadwood High School. Uh, her father operated the Maitland mine. I traveled around the Black Hills six years ago and was amazed to discover the Sanford Visitor Center. Wow. So uh, who said this? Roberta? Yes. So Roberta, I lived just off Maitland Road um, until very recently. So we just moved. Um, but the Maitland mine was just off Maitland Road, which is where our, our home actually had an old mining road that, that went right through it. Fantastic. This was so interesting. Well, um, you said you didn't know what it was going to be. And this is, uh, I don't even sometimes know how to describe where I work or what I get to do, but it's just the best. And so important also, the educational component that, is. Um, and, and that's what we feel so like really good about. Like the science is super important and it's our funding source and all of those things. But um, SURF is super committed to that outreach work, super, super committed to it. And I feel very honored um, and grateful to uh, our board of directors and our executive director for having that vision. And, you know, I loved the picture you showed with all little girls, yeah. um, you know, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sure you have pictures of Native American children, sure. um, you know, working on these science experiments. I think that's, that's so great. Um, this seems so important and valuable, and yet it's like this big secret out in the open. Um, has anybody from the government come to visit? Like, oh, absolutely. Actually, um, the, uh, well, I'm not gonna get his title right, uh, but basically the director of the Department of Energy. Uh, the secretary or? Not, or, not the secretary. Oh, okay. Um, that would, would oversee the particle physics or the high energy physics portion that we're part of um, was here just a few months ago. Uh, and so, and um, um, so yes, absolutely. Um, there, there is awareness and communication and we work, we work pretty hard um, to try to um, share that story, not only because we think it's an important story to tell, but also because we want others, like we can't do this alone. This is a, this is a big job and we need all hands on deck while rowing in the same direction. I, yeah, it's, Thank you, Wendy. I, it, I mean, <laughs> it's government working, Yes, yes. <laughs> which is it really, really, really exciting. Really is. It really is. Um, this was so interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Uncle Dorrance. We was Thank you, Uncle Dorrance and Aunt Lydia and mom, if you happen to be out there. <laughs> um, this was really, really wonderful. Um, we didn't have a huge crowd today, but the people who are here, I know really enjoyed it. We all learned something new and um, how, how very cool that you get to work at such an exciting place. And I know you're good at your job because you're so effervescent and 
bubbly and enthusiastic about science. Um, I am like, it's a great strength and a bit of a challenge sometimes too. But you really should, um, I'll send you the links for the YouTube presentations um, from Michelle, the Astro Educator. Absolutely. You guys would like each other a lot. Okay, all um, right, all right. That sounds awesome. She, she makes outer space fun and, um, and she's a very popular speaker. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone have a great week. Thank yes. you all very much for taking time out of your day um, to be here and to be present. Um, and like I said, visit uh, sanfordlab.org and learn a little bit more. Absolutely. You, um, there are some people who are saying in the comments that they're retired science teachers and they want to make their way out there. Awesome. Uh, next week, we're going to hear from uh, Patrick Reardon, who is going to tell us all about the um, a different kind of mechanical project, the loop, um, all about the Chicago subway system. And um, an equally fascinating big project that, you know, you can't believe it works, but it, it does. So thank you so much, um, Deb. It was Thanks. really terrific. And um, we will talk again. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.